He did not stop creating. He did not stop being the creator. If you need a creative miracle, he's the creator. The narrow road is the more difficult road, but the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. I'm doing part two today of our series, Sharing Your Faith, Becoming a Laborer in the Harvest. How many of you want to be a laborer in the harvest? Well, I'm going to give you some tools today to help you become a laborer in the harvest. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36 through 38, but he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Get that last verse. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. We might pray that and we're thinking, Lord, send somebody else. Lord, send laborers. Don't send me. Lord, we need harvesters. We need laborers. But let it be somebody else. But God's calling you. You. And you. And you. (laughs) You're thinking, no, not me. Yes, you. God is calling you into laboring in the harvest. You know, when they would harvest by hand, it took many, many laborers to harvest by hand. Some of you are migrant workers. You come and go uh, up north to Minnesota and all in those places, and you come back down here to the valley, and you do migrant work. And it takes a lot of hands when you're, mar- you're harvesting by hand. And it takes a lot of hands to harvest this earth. It's going to take a lot of laborers, and I can't do it all myself. You can't do it all yourself. Our church can't do it all. Just our church can't reach every single person in the valley, can they? It's going to take all the churches. That's what this move is about. How many of you know we're in a move? We're in a move. We're in a move of God right now. It's not happening. It's here. We're in a move right now. And the move is the churches are coming together in unity to reach our communities, to reach the real Grandy Valley. And not only from Brownsville to Laredo, as we've been declaring, but on both sides of the border. Because we are very much connected to the other side of the border here in South Texas, are we not? Amen. So we are in a move, and it's going to take all of us working together to reach our cities, to reach the people in our towns. It's going to take you to reach the people that you work with. It's going to take you to reach your family. And so I want to encourage you today to be willing to be a harvester in this harvest, a laborer. You know, we can start with the people that's closest to us. That's what we talked about last week. I'll just review a little bit. You know, um, John pointed Jesus out to two of his disciples, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And they followed him. They left John, and they followed him. And then one of them named Andrew, he went and got his brother, Simon Peter, and he brought him to Jesus. And then later, it says that Jesus called Philip, and what does Philip do? He went and got Nathaniel, and Nathaniel was a bit doubtful about this. He was a little bit skeptical. Have you ever witnessed to somebody that was doubtful or a little skeptical of what you were saying? But what did Philip tell Nathaniel? You remember? He said, come and see. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Come and see what I'm talking about. Come, see this man. And that's what we need to do when the people that we witness to, they're skeptical, they're doubtful. Say, that's okay, just come and see. Just come check it out. Just come, you can sit in the back, you can hide, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Just come check it out. Just come check it out. Come check church out. Come with me, I'll sit with you. We'll have lunch after church. Hey, that gets a lot of people in church. Hey, I want to invite you to come with me to lunch right after church. You want to come with me? And then we can go wherever you want to go. That's a good one. (laughs) 
That'll get a lot of people sitting next to you who wouldn't normally come. We can use our testimony to reach many, many people. We all have a story. All of us have a story. We all have things that have happened in our life that have got us right to the place that we are right now. And we can look back and we say, but if it, if it weren't for the Lord, if it weren't for Jesus, I wouldn't be where I am today. Whatever your story is, you can use it. Remember, we talked about the demoniac in the tombs in the Gadarenes. You know, when, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, are you here to torment me? And, um, you know, Jesus wasn't there to, to pass judgment at the moment, but, you know, he did cast the demons, this legion of demons, out of this man. And then once again, he was clothed in, in his right mind, and he wasn't a, being the way he was before. He wasn't out of his mind. The Bible says he was in his right mind. And he wanted to follow Jesus and to go with him, but Jesus said no. He said, you need to go and share your story. And that's exactly what he did. He went to the Decapolis, 10 city region and shared his testimony. Don't you know that everybody around that area knew who this crazy man was? They probably talked about him. Hey, he's that man that lives in the graveyard. He lives among the dead people. He's always crying out in anguish, and he's cutting himself with sharp stones. He's totally out of his mind. You know, they've tried to bind him several times, but he just breaks free because he has ex, uh, extra uh, strength, extraordinary strength. It said that no one could bind him. I mean, that's demonic. That's the demonic strength that he had. And everyone around that area knew about him. But when they saw him whole, and when they saw him dressed, and they saw him in his right mind, and they saw him tamed, so to speak, because they said, remember, that no one could tame him. Maybe you were much like the man in the tombs. Maybe you were so lost. Maybe you were one of those that would cut themselves. Maybe you were in great, deep emotional pain. Maybe you were an alcoholic. Or maybe you were addicted to drugs. Maybe you were like the woman at the well who just went from relationship, from relationship, from to relationship. And she was so broken. So broken when Jesus found her. But what did she do? She went and told everybody. She said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. He prophesied to her. He read her mail. He told her, you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not even your husband. You're just living with him. And it amazed her, this sight that he had into her personal life. And all of those that came were absolutely amazed. And it says that they begged him to stay in their region because they were so hungry. This world is hungry. There are people that are so hungry and if you would just step out a little bit out of your timidity, a little bit out of your shyness, you might be able to share with them your story, what God did with your life. Maybe you've been to prison. Maybe you know what it is to be locked up. Maybe you know what it is to have a, a criminal background. You can minister to somebody who's maybe at the halfway house. Maybe somebody who's spending the weekend in county jail because they got another DWI. Maybe you've been there before and you can say, look what Jesus did with my life. Let me tell you about a man who told me everything I ever did. Let me tell you about a man who changed my life forever. Hallelujah. Each of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You might say, oh, I'm not, I'm not in ministry. No, no, I'm not in ministry. He's given all of us the ministry of reconciliation, all of us. All of us, the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. 
and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I'm going to give you the message of reconciliation today. So you know the message, that you know why you believe what you believe so that you can share it with somebody else. Sometimes that's why we don't share Jesus, because we're not really sure why we believe what we believe. But the word of God is very clear, and you can know today. You can know how to share the gospel with somebody else in a very simple way. The gospel's not hard. It's not hard. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. As ambassadors of Christ, as Christians, we are those ambassadors. It's as if God is imploring people to come to him through us. We are Jesus' hands and feet in the earth. Is that not what the word of the Lord was to us for this year? The last point on that list was we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the ambassadors for Christ. It is God imploring others to come to him through our testimony and the things that we share with them. Amen. Ephesians 2, 12 through 13, at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. And now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ is what brings us near to God. All of us were in that place at one time, having no hope without God and in the world. The Bible says no hope without God in the world. We were all there one time or another. We were all there. But now we're in Christ. You knew and you know what it's like to be out there with no hope with no direction. What is my purpose? Why am I here? So how do we, the ambassadors of Christ, lead others to salvation? I'm going to give you some scriptures this morning that are going to help you to know and to understand why you believe what you believe and that you can share it with somebody else. As a matter of fact, all of our notes are on our church app. If you haven't downloaded our church app, you're welcome to do that. You just put in the name of the church, and our fish logo will pop up, and you can watch. You can see there. You can watch the services. You can see our notes in English and Spanish. And all of these scriptures are on there. So we don't have any excuse to say we don't know how to share the gospel. Because I tell you, everybody has a cell phone, do they not? If you're 10 years old enough, you probably have one. <laughs> and, it, and they're on there. You either have a Bible or you have the notes for today, and you will have your scriptures and you'll be ready. Amen? Amen. The first thing we need to do is we need to tell people that God loves them. There's so many people in the world, their life is such a mess that they don't think anybody could love them at all, especially Father God. Maybe you were that person at one time. You were so lost, your life was so messed up, you didn't think anyone could love you at all. People need to know that God loves them, no matter what state they may be in. I don't care where you are today. What's happening in your life? The things that you have done in your past and even this very morning, God still loves you. He still loves you. He's looking to reconcile you back to him. He's not a God that's looking to judge you and to whack you on the head with his big spiritual hammer and put you in your place. He's a God of mercy and compassion. And it's his goodness and his kindness that leads us to a place of repentance. 
Yes, we do need to repent of, the, of our ways, but he's the one that leads us into it. That conviction of the Holy Spirit will begin to make things right in our life. Many times people think that they have to get all cleaned up, get all their ducks in a row, get off of the drugs, get off the alcohol, stop doing what they're doing, and then they can come to Christ. Let me tell you, we just have to catch them and God cleans them. Just like the fish, like I told you before, I catch them and my husband cleans them. <laughs> I don't know how to clean fish. That's his job at our house. <laughs> we catch them and he cleans them. And I'll cook them and definitely eat them. <laughs> he cooks them too. He cooks them really good on the back porch in a big uh, deep fryer. Mm, right? Are you getting hungry? <laughs> Hallelujah, not for a while. <laughs> but I tell you, God, God loves us. And he loves us enough not to leave us where we're at. Some people are afraid to come to Christ because they're afraid of what they might have to give up. They're afraid that they won't be able to walk the line. Maybe they've tried it before and they failed. Maybe they followed the Lord for a while, but they backslid. They went back into their own life. And this time they're more afraid than before to get right with God. But I tell you, God is a good God. If we will stay hooked up with him, even if we struggle, even if you fall, if you will not walk away, you will have victory. You will have victory. And people need to know that, that God loves them that much. That much that he will not leave them where they are, but he will take them through a process of sanctification till they are free of the things that are binding them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the whole gospel in a nutshell right there. That God loved so much, he gave his son for us so that none would perish. None would die and go to hell. Romans 8, or excuse me, 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love towards us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in the pit of sin, Christ's blood was still there for us. He still died for us. The whole world was in sin from the time of Adam. And Christ still died for that hope of redemption that was coming through his blood. We've all sinned. Not one of us is righteous. We've all sinned. We were born into sin. In 1 John 1, 7 through 10, it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and his blood, or the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Many times we witness to people, and these may be very good people. Sometimes we think that, that, that the sinners are, are, are the worst of sinners. <laughs> no, there's a lot of good people out there in the world that are living good lives, but they don't know Jesus. They're still a sinner. They're still lost. They're still without hope in the world without God. And I've met a few good people, have you? And they're the ones sometimes that we have to, to show them this verse that we've all sinned. Many times even taking them back to the commandments. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, most people will confess that they've told a lie. Have you ever broken any of the other commandments? <laughs> Have you ever stolen anything? A little piece of gum, pencil, paper clip from the office? Just small things, just white lies. Nothing big, nothing major. I've never committed murder. 
I don't do drugs. These are some things that we tend to justify ourselves with, but we're all guilty of sin, every single one of us. But Jesus came to save us all, to seek and to save the lost. Even those good people, they're good people, they're doing good things, but they don't know Jesus. They need to know Jesus because good works are not going to get us into heaven. Our good works is not what writes our name in heaven. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? Some people are so guilty in their conscience. They feel so condemned every day because of what they're going through that they don't think that God can have mercy on them. They don't think that God can forgive them. Their conscience is just riddled with guilt. When you come across a person whose conscience is riddled with guilt and they just can't get past what they've done, You need to show them this verse right here. Verse 9, Hebrews 9, 14. I'm going to read it again. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, and cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse a conscience. Only the blood of Jesus, when we repent and we invite him to be our savior, he's the only one that lifts off the blood guiltiness out of our mind. The only one. No amount of counseling, no amount of drugs, no amount of prescription drugs and Zoloft and all of these things that the doctors prescribe can rid a guilty conscience can't cleanse a guilty conscience, only the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to hear that today. Somebody needs to know today that it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses your conscience. You are not meant to carry it with you. You are not meant to carry your past with you to the point you feel so condemned that you can't move forward. You weren't meant to carry it. You were meant to leave it at the cross. You were meant to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. It's not enough just to believe that God exists. The Bible says that we must be born again. Jesus said we must be born again. Just like these good people that we're talking about. We have a lot of good people in our family, but they don't know Jesus. They're not out breaking a bunch of laws. They're not hoodlums. They're, you know, they're good people. They don't know Jesus. They're just as lost as the next person. It's, I mean, many people will say, well, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. A lot of response that we get here in the valley is when you try to witness to somebody, they say, well, I'm Catholic. And they think that just closes the door. It doesn't. But do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? It's not enough to have religion. It's not enough to say, well, I believe that there's a higher power. Oh, yeah, I believe that there's a God. But are you born again? Jesus said in John 3, 3, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Not if you have religion, not if you have good works, not if you just believe that a God exists but that you're born again. John 3, 5 through 6, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and Spirit gives birth to Spirit. We were all born of the flesh. 
or born of the water. We all came out of our mother's stomach in one way or the other. We had our first birth. But we are all to have a second birth, a spiritual birth, which Jesus calls being born again. And we need that spiritual birth to enter in to the kingdom of God. It says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, this is the Roman road that I referred to last week. You remember that? <laughs> I said, don't worry if you don't have the Roman road memorized. You can still bring somebody to Christ. Well, here it is. This is what they call the Roman road. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is how you're born again. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart and you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. As we believe in Jesus Christ, and as we pray, and we make that confession with the words of our mouth, then we receive Christ as Savior, and we become what Jesus said, born again. It's really easy. It's not complicated. We believe in our heart, We confess it with our mouth in prayer. We invite him in, and we are saved. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me, And go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I would like for our ushers to go ahead and begin to serve our communion. And if the worship team would come back up. There are so many people in our lives and out in the community. And maybe you're even here today. That you don't know that God has a plan for your life. Maybe you're just going through the motions. You get up every day, you eat, you sleep, you go to work, you come home, you eat, you sleep, you go to work, you come home, you get the pattern, right? But God has a plan and a purpose. He has so much more than eat, sleep, and go to work for us. He has a plan, plans of good and not evil. To give you a future and a hope. He wants to renew your hope. That was one of the words for this year. It says a year of renewed hope. People need to know that God has a plan for their life. Sometimes people get into difficult, very hard situations. And they want to blame God. And they say, well, I guess that's the plan of God. No, that's the plan of the devil. Because if you're not on God's plan, you're on default to the devil's plan. His plan is to kill, to steal, and destroy everything in your life that he possibly can. If you feel like you're under attack by the enemy, he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy everything in your life, I invite you to get on God's plan. I invite you to come to know Jesus Christ and to enter into that plan. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil. Evil doesn't come from God. To give you a future and a hope. Then listen to verse 12. I love this. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen. God will listen to your prayers. Sometimes people think God's not listening to them. God will listen to your prayers. 
Then I will, you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. When you search for me with all of your heart, it says I'll be found by you. The Lord will allow us to be in his presence. He has a plan for your life. Have you come to the end of your rope? Are you done doing it your own way and ready to let the Lord be the boss? To let the Lord be the Lord, the master? Because he has a plan and he has a purpose for you that's much better than anything that we could come up with on our own. We need to encourage people to read the scriptures. When we witness to somebody and they receive the Lord, and even if they don't receive the Lord, it's good sometimes to give them a Bible. Um, we have a lot of Bibles here. Um, I buy them at a discounted price because I buy them in bulk. You would like a witnessing Bible? You can come to the office. We'll sell it to you for $2. That's just barely over what I, I pay for it to cover shipping. I'll give you three or four Bibles. Go out and witness to people and give them a Bible. Many people have been won to the Lord just by opening the book itself. Just opening it and beginning to read. And they're so intrigued, they can't stop turning the pages. They can't put it down. They don't know Jesus. They're reading about this man that they've never heard about. They're hearing about the miracles. They're healing about... They're hearing about the compassion that he had on people. And I tell you, the word is powerful. And it's alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word, even in itself, can bring a person to the place of salvation where they can know Jesus. It says in Romans 10, 17, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the number one way we increase in our faith is to read the word. We need to read the word and we need to encourage those we witness to to read the word. If they don't have one, put one in their hand. I always encourage people to start with the book of John. I just really love the book of John because it really get you really get to know who Jesus is. It's got John 3:16 in it. You can't pass up John chapter 3 without knowing about salvation, right? Because Jesus explains it to Nicodemus. I also love the book of Matthew. Why? Because Matthew brings out prophecy. Everywhere in the book of Matthew, Matthew refers back to the prophet. And the prophet said about the birth of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And I believe that that's something that can be very convincing to people is to see how prophecy from the Old Testament has been fulfilled in the New Testament. That's exactly how Lee Strobel came to the Lord. He set out to disprove this Christianity because his wife became a Christian and just messed everything up. And he was mad. He was kind of jealous of her new friend, Jesus. So he set out to disprove this Christianity thing. So where did he start the Bible? He starts reading the Bible. He travels to different places to talk to theologians and to biblical scholars and to get their impression and their take on this. He even saw the Shroud of Torin, I think you call it. And that really moved his heart as well. In the end, he ended up proving that Christ really existed and rose from the dead by many infallible proofs in the Word of God. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And now he is a Christian apologetist who goes around all of the world uh, debating the Word of God. He debates over creation, evolutionism, uh, many different things. If you've never read any of his books, I encourage you. I love the book, A Case for Creation. I have all of Lee Strobel's books. <laughs> They're amazing. Case for Miracles, A Case for Faith, 
the case for creation. I tell you, you cannot read a faith for creation without recognizing what an awesome God that we serve and how this world was created. It's incredible. And the last thing, and certainly not least, we need to encourage those that we minister to to come to church. It's the pattern that was in the Bible. It says in Acts 2, 4 through 6, so continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They came to church, but they were also meeting together. And that's God's plans and principles for the church. We're to come together on Sundays at our temple to worship and to praise him, to fellowship with one another, but we're also to meet, as it says, house to house. That's why I want to encourage you to get involved with our life care ministries because they're smaller groups where you're going to make great connections with people, where you're going to learn the Word of God, you're going to be discipled, you'll have some accountability with people so that they can check in on you, you're doing okay. We all need people in our life to help us in this walk. We weren't meant to do it alone. We were meant to be part of a church, part of a church family, and to be part of these smaller gatherings. And in our life care ministries, we will have smaller groups. Some of the groups will be here at the church. Some groups will be in people's homes. We have prayer meetings that are smaller groups every day of the week. We have other groups that are meeting in our church just to fellowship, to eat, to worship, to pray together. And this is the way God designed it so that we can have community and fellowship together. You weren't meant to walk the road alone. It might be narrow, but it's not a lonely road. Jesus said we need to take the narrow road, but he didn't say it had to be lonely. <laughs> Let's have community. Let's have fellowship. Let's get to know one another. Let's love each other. Let's welcome people into our circles. Because God's big enough. His love is big enough to extend the love that's in our heart to accept all who come in. Does everybody have their communion this morning? I want to encourage you this morning, if you would like to be a group leader, one of these life care groups where you bring people into your home, you have a Bible study together, you have fellowship, some worship, and I'll teach you how to do it. It's really easy. I'll even give you the DVD and show you how to do it. If you would like to be one of these life care small group leaders, I want you to sign up in the foyer. I have a clipboard. You see a little picture out there with a fish on it. It says life care inside the fish. If you would like to be part of this, please sign up and I will call you this week and we will pick out some uh, curriculum. Each one of our groups is something different. And we will next week, next Sunday, we're going to start signing people up for those groups. So if you want to be a group leader, I need you to sign up today. Today. <laughs> today. Okay? <laughs> Time is of the essence. And I will be ordering the curriculum. It will get here quickly. And I need to have it out next week. We will have our clipboards. And if you want to join one of these small groups, you just sign up with your name and your phone number. And the leader will give you a call. They'll tell you where they're going to meet. And they'll invite you into their group. Amen? Amen. And we'll talk more about that next week. But I need you to sign up if you want to be a leader. Well, let's show forth the bread this morning. Hallelujah. As we've talked about Jesus this morning and all that he's done for us, how he died on the cross, 
how he shed his blood for us, how he welcomed us in even though we were sinners, how his blood cleanses us and cleanses our conscience, how we are accepted in the beloved, If you want to be one of those who wants to receive Jesus Christ today, I want you to stand up wherever you're at. If you want to receive Jesus today, this Jesus that I've been talking about, you say, I've never received Jesus before. I believe that there's a God, but I'm not born again yet. I'd like for you to stand up wherever you're at. I want to pray for you. I'm not here to embarrass you. But we do have to take a stand for God. So if that's you today, just stand wherever you at. Wherever you are, just take your communion and stand up. Because I want to pray for you. Is there anyone? Hallelujah, I see you. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? I tell you, sometimes it just takes one to open the gate. Is there anyone today you say, I need Jesus? I've got a guilty conscience. I need the Lord to wash it because I can't carry this anymore. You weren't meant to carry it. His blood already paid the price. Amen. Thank you. Is there anyone else? God loves you so much. He doesn't want anyone to leave this building without knowing him. I know that there's others. Please, I beseech you by the mercies of Christ that you'll surrender your life to him. The same Jesus that saves you is the same one that can present you faultless before the Father. That's what it says in the book of Jude. Maybe you've walked with the Lord before, but you've walked away. You, you tried serving the Lord, but things got in the way, and you just went your own way. If you can identify with that, would you stand? Because I want to pray for you as well. I want to help you find your way back to a loving God who's merciful and kind. Amen. Anyone else? You say, I want to find my way back today. I'm done doing it myself. I got to that point in my life where I said, I'm done trying to do it myself because I just mess it up. I got to be all in. Many of us who were raised in the church, we had one foot in the church doors and one foot in the world. And I had to come to a place in my life where I was all in, all in. If you want to be all in today, stand up. Now I'm just going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. You can pray from where you're at. That's fine. And I'll ask everybody to, to pray along with you. Let's just say this together. Just as it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. That's what we're going to do. Say, Father God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for my sins. I believe that God raised him from the dead. Father God, I acknowledge my sin before you. And I ask you to forgive me of every sin that I have ever committed. And I ask you to wash me with the blood of Jesus and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I ask you, Lord, write my name in heaven. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. 
I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Now we're ready to partake of the communion. 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and partake of the bread. We thank you, Father, for this bread that we receive today, that it represents your broken body for us. And we receive it, Father God, for healing in our body, Father, restoration of our mind and of our soul. In Jesus' name. Take your cup. It says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus, we remember you today. We remember all that you did on the cross for us. We remember that we must be born again. We remember that it's your blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We remember it's your blood that washes us from a guilty conscience. We remember you, Lord, and we love you, God, today. We worship you in Jesus' name. Let us partake together. Hallelujah. If our prayer partners will come to the front right now, if you need prayer for anything in your life at all, I want you to come up and see one of these prayer partners. If you gave your life to Jesus Christ today, would you come by the guest information center for me so that I might meet you and pray with you personally today? I'd love to meet you personally and pray for you. So please, if you would, come by the guest information center. Hallelujah. Well, stand with me right now, and let's just bless each other with this blessing from Romans, or excuse me, Numbers, chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.